Crumlin Towns in Brunswick by famous Hanover City. The river Vase, a deep and wide, washes its wall on the southern side, a pleasanter spot you never spied. But when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. babies in the cradles, and ate the cheeses out of the vats, and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests inside men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by droning their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mares are noddy, and as for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with ermine for dolts that can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old and obese to find in the furry civic robies. Rouse up, sirs. Give your brains a racking to find the remedy we're lacking, or sure as fate we'll send you packing. <laughs> At this, the mayor and corporation quaked with a mighty consternation.
An hour they sat in council. At length, the mayor broke silence. For a gilder, I'd my ermine gown sell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I've scratched it so and all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap. A trap! Just as he said this, what should happen at the chamber door but a gentle tap? Bless us! cried the mayor. What's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little, though wondrous fat, nor brighter was his eye, nor moister than a too long opened oyster, mm -hmm. save when at noon his paunch grew mutinous for a plate of turtle, green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on the mat. Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pitter-pat. Uh, uh, come in, the mayor cried, looking bigger. And in did come the strangest figure. His queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red. And he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin. With light, loose hair, yet swarthy skin. No tuft on cheek, nor beard on chin, but lips where smiles went out and in. There was no guessing his kith and kin, and nobody could enough admire the tall man and his quaint attire, quoth one. It's as my great-grandsire, starting up at the trump of doomstone, had walked this way from his painted tombstone. He advanced to the council table, and... Please, Your Honour, said he, I'm able, by means of a secret charm, to draw all creatures living beneath the sun that creep or swim or fly or run after me, so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm. The mole and toad and newt and viper. And people call me <clears throat> the Pied Piper. And here they noticed round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe to match with his coat of the selfsame check. And at the scarf's end hung a pipe. And his fingers, they noticed, were ever straying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as low it dangled over his vesture so old-fangled. Yet, said he, poor piper as I am, in Tartary I freed the charm last June from his huge swarms of gnats. I eased in Asia the Nizam of a monstrous brood of vampire bats. Mm. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I can rid your town of rats, will you give me a thousand guilders? One? Fifty thousand! was the exclamation of the astonished man corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Then, like a musical adept, to blow the pipe his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes the pipe uttered,
you heard as if an army muttered. Muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses the rats came tumbling. Great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, grey rats, tawny rats, brave old plodders, gay young friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the piper for their lives. From street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing. until they came to the river Visa, wherein all plunged and perished. <laughs> Save one who, stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry as he, the manuscript he cherished, to Ratland home his commentary. Which was? At the first shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as of scraping tripe and putting apples wondrous ripe into a cider press's gripe and a moving away of pickle tub boards and a leaving a jar of conserved cupboards and a drawing the corks of train oil flasks and a breaking the hoops of butter casks and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than by harp or by psaltery is breathed called out oh rats rejoice the world is grown to one vast dry saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your lunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on. And just as a bulky sugar puncheon already staved like a great sun shone, glorious scarce an inch before me, just as me thought it said, can't bore me. I found the phaser rolling o'er me. You should have heard the Hamlin people ringing the bells till they rocked the steeple.
cried the mayor. And get long poles! Poke out the nests and block up the holes! Consult with carpenters and builders and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats! And suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace with a First, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders. The mayor looked blue. So did the corporation, too. For council dinners made rare havoc with claret Moselle Vin de Grave Hoc. And half the money would replenish their cellar's biggest butt with Rhenish. To pay this sum to a wandering fellow with a gypsy coat of red and yellow. Beside, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, and what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not the folks to shrink from the duty of giving you something for drink and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the guilders, what we spoke of them, as you very well know, was in joke. Beside, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand guilders! Come. Take fifty. The piper's face fell. And he cried, no trifling, I can't wait. Beside, I've promised to visit by dinner time Baghdad and accept the prime of the head cook's pottage, all he's rich in. For having left in the caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him, I proved no bargain driver. With you, don't think I'll bait a stiver. And folks who put me in a passion may find me pipe after another fashion. Oh, cried the mayor. Do you think I brook being worse treated than a cook? Insulted by a lazy ribald with idle pipe and vesture piebald? You threaten us, fellow? Do your worst. Blow your Pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth straight cane. And there he blew three notes. Such sweet, soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling of merry crowds jostling and pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping and little tongues chattering. And like fowls in a farmyard when barley is scattering, out came the children running. All the little boys and girls with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping, ran merrily after the wonderful music with shouting and laughter. They were changed into blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by. Could only follow with the eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back. But how the mayor was on the rack and the wretched consul's bosoms beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the vase rolled its waters right in the way of their sons and daughters.
However he turned from south to west, and to Koppelberg Hill his steps addressed, and after him the children pressed. Great was the joy in every breast. He never can cross that mighty top. He's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, as they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed. And the piper advanced, and the children followed. And when all were in to the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? No, one was lame and could not dance the whole of the way. And in after years, if you would blame his sadness, he was used to say, It's dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town and just at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew and flowers put forth a fairer hue. And everything was strange and new. The sparrows were brighter than peacocks here, and their dogs outran our fallow deer. And honeybees had lost their stings, and horses were born with eagles' wings. And just as I became assured my lame foot would be speedily cured, the music stopped, and I stood still and found myself outside the hill, left alone against my will to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas for Hamelin. There came into many a burgher's pate a text which says that heaven's gate opes to the rich at as easy rate as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mayor sent east, west, north and south to offer the piper by word of mouth wherever it was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content if he'd only return the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was a lost endeavour and piper and dancers were gone forever, they made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly if, after the day of the month and year, these words did not as well appear. And so long after what happened here on the 22nd of July, 1376, and the better in memory to fix, the place of the children's last retreat, they called it, the Pied Piper's Street, where anyone playing on pipe or tabor was sure for the future to lose his labor, nor suffered they hostelry or tavern to shock with mirth a street so solemn. But opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote the story on a column, and on the great church window painted the same 
to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away. And there it stands to this very day. And I must not omit to say that in Transylvania there's a tribe of alien people who ascribe the outlandish ways and dress on which their neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers having risen out of some subterraneous prison into which they were trepanned long time ago in a mighty band out of Hamelin Town in Brunswick land. But how or why they don't understand. So, Willie, let me and you be wipers of scores out with all men, especially pipers, and whether they pipe us free from rats or from mice, if we've promised them all, let us keep our promise.